Okay, I um, appreciate the introduction and I would like to share with you, this is a, called a workshop, but it's going to be more a trip, a voyage, um, because my interest is in trying to get my students and my employees to perform. And long ago I learned that there's a big difference between training people and getting them to perform. So I've always been very interested in trying to find performance. And as Najib said, I have um, been here several times talking about blended learning. And I'll start off with that. But then I also want to share with you the journey that I have taken that took us from blended learning to performance. And there are several intermediate steps that at the beginning of this journey I did not expect to find. Well, blended learning, first of all, is essentially somewhere in a continuum between totally being off somewhere learning in front of a computer and similarly being totally off somewhere at the university, prisoner in the classroom, listening to a professor saying whatever he wants to tell you. Okay. So blended learning is a mixture and in order to blend the course, one has to have many, many considerations that come into play. One has to be concerned with the technology that is going to be used. One has to be concerned with the role of the instructor. If I'm not going to be there and instruct, if I'm going to use a computer, what's the role between the technology and me? The same with the students. If the students are not there to listen to me, then what is their role going to be as learners? How are they going to effectuate it? They um, have Typically in blended learning, there's a collaboration component and that has to be looked at. In addition, you have to make a decision in learning spaces. A typical stadium like um, amphitheater might be good for lecturing, but it's not very good if you want to have students to collaborate. So one has to think about how to organize the learning space that is going to be used. Also. Um, what kind of learning materials are you going to use for what you do in class in the blended part and what you're going to be doing out of class? So all of these are ingredients that you have to think about when you prepare a blended course. And when you do that, essentially you're stirring a bunch of ideas into a pot because there's really, everyone has different ideas as to how each of these elements are to go in. Everybody has their own recipe, if you will, for how to do a blended course. So I have always indicated here that you cannot do blended learning unless you make it part of a continual improvement process. And that continual improvement process basically starts the best thing, you start the course with the best syllabus that you can provide, then you teach the course, then you look at the results, you study the results, you decide what else you need to add or take out, then you redo the syllabus, and then you go back to this plan, study, do and act cycle, which is an old Deming quality control TQM kind of an idea. But it is necessary because at the beginning, we never know whether what we put together is going to work or not. So you have to be able to tie that to a way that you can change your course in a purposeful way to get better and better learning and more and more satisfied students. So, I have gone through a number of cycles over the past um, several years, and the way that I blend my course, um, which may or may not work for you, but this is the result of my continual improvement process, is I provide my students with my lectures on the videotape. I essentially provide video lectures for my students. I also write lecture notes and I do not use a textbook because quite frankly, textbooks are not written for students. Textbooks are written for faculty. Why? Because faculty by that make decisions as to what text to use. And furthermore, faculty would like to feel very important because then they can translate what students can understand to the students. So again, the whole idea of textbooks is a notion that um, intrigues me because it makes no sense from a learning, from a student standpoint, because they're not written for students typically. So I provide students with 
all of the information they need to learn a part or meet a particular learning objectives. And if they learn that material outside of class, I can let them take a quiz and they don't have to come to class. On the other hand, if they can't learn that material, if they can't demonstrate that they have achieved proficiency, then they come to class and they can engage with a group in trying to problem-based learning, trying to learn the concepts from each other. If they run into difficulties, that is now where I come in because I am a roaming coach and consultant. I watch students, what they do in their large screens that they have, and if I see something wrong, then I blow my whistle very much like a football coach and say, Oops, wait a minute, stop, let me, this is what you're doing wrong, you have to fix it. Now, I work that way with the groups. Now, in every group or in many groups, there are individuals that still have a hard time getting it, so then I provide consulting. Then I sit down with them individually and I tutor them as an individual. So again, my level of engagement is I prepare the materials, I put the lectures on the video, and then I provide consulting and, and coaching. And in that way, students get the material that they need when they know they need it. So it's just in time learning for students. They learn material when they perceive the need to know something. So at any point in time, the student can take the quiz. When they can take the quiz, they don't have to stay for the rest of the class. So there's a lot of motivation for students to come prepared to class or be able to pass the quiz before class. Well, this is the model that I use. And what I have found after going through this process is that the real problem that we have is that when students collaborate, they really don't know how to go about it. We assume as instructors that group projects are good for students. At the same time, we may like them, but students generally hate them. At the same time, one of the reasons that they hate them is because they run into problems working with the group. Now, they may have had coursework, they may have all sorts of training teaming, but when it comes time to practice it, they have a difficulty. So we found that collaboration is a, is a major issue. Students don't really know how to work in teams. Industry needs people that can work in teams. That's the way industry works. At the same time, when you put students in a team, then we might say that team stands for together, everyone avoids more. Okay. So how do we fix that? Well, what we did to fix that is we first realized that the problem is that students, even in business schools, where they learn about management and where they learn about teamwork and leadership, there is too much lecturing, too much reading. But again, just like riding a bicycle, you can learn how to ride a bicycle by reading about it. Well, you can't learn to be a leader or a team worker just by reading about it. You have to develop those particular concepts. So what we decided to do is in a, in a course, and this is any course, could I do it in my course in particular, is I take about two weeks at the beginning of the course and I review teamwork fundamentals with students. Now, once they have these fundamentals, I have modularized my course, chapters if you will, and I have students collaborate on learning a chapter as a team, and once they have collaborated, then they have to take a quiz as an individual. And once they have learned the first chapter, then they have to learn the second chapter collaborating. Through collaborating, they further practice collaboration, but as they learn to collaborate better, they also learn how to learn the subject matter better. So there is a synergistic effect between them learning how to work in a team better, and at the same time, learn the subject material better. So we call that contextual lead leadership development because students are learning about leadership or teamwork within the context of the subject matter that they are learning. So basically they learn, we review for them the teamwork knowledge that they need, then we have them essentially work as a group, then at the end they, um, we test the subject matter knowledge, then they go on, but at the same time, 
as they have done this, they have increased their teaming abilities for the next thing that they are going to learn. So you essentially have a feedback loop. The more you learn about teaming, the more you're able to learn <coughs> the subject matter information. Now, the kind of leadership that I'm talking about here is not the positional leadership. We are an industry, you've been promoted now to manager or to group leader, and now you've been designated as a leader, and people better do what you say, or else, or whatever. We're talking about shared leadership, the kind of leadership, or teamwork that is required in a group, or in a committee, or in any civic organization, if you will. And in that kind of a situation, the shared leadership concept, every individual can be a potential leader as well as a follower. You may know about something today and somebody else may know more about it the next time. So if you know more about it, then you take a leadership position, bring everybody along and then somebody else knows more than you, something else, and they change the rules. Now to have effective leadership like this, shared leadership where every person is a follower as well as a leader, then you need to have the team functioning according to certain principles and the individual members of the team must demonstrate qualities and values that contribute to the functioning of the team. So, how are we going to operationalize that? Well, we, again, indicated to provide up front in the two weeks um, teamwork theory, which is the fundamentals. We go into team formation, how do you put a team together? And then we make the teams develop a contractual ar arrangement on how they're going to collaborate, when, what the penalties are for non um, accomplishment, for non collaboration. And then we practice these concepts over and over throughout the entire semester. So, team formation is extremely important. In um, my university and the universities I've been at, many times instructors say, ah, okay, I'm going to form the teams. Why? Oh, because that's the way industry does it. Well, that's a total bunch of baloney because that's not the way industry does it. The last thing you want in industry is to leave success to chance, which is what you do when you randomly assign people to a team. In industry, we pay a lot of attention to making sure that we put the right teams together that accomplish their particular mission. So what we do then is we provide students with information about each other. We ask students to take a personal personality test. We ask students to take a locus of control test. And that is published on the discussion board. And then we um, also ask them to indicate where they live. Many of our students are distance learning. So it's nice for people to know who else in the area is taking distance learning courses. But we also do this for people that come to class. And all this information is put on the discussion board. Once that is done, then we simulate what is we refer to as a fantasy football draft. People here can essentially be managers of a fantasy or an imaginary team, and then they can go through a process of forming teams, and then teams can go and look for members. So what we do is if there are any two students that want, that want to form a team, then you can start and you post that on your discussion board. Students that need a team have their information on the discussion board, and then there's a dialogue between the teams and the students as to who is going to be on what, on what particular team. So after we have that, then we ask the students to write the team charter, and again, a team charter is uh, basically a contractual agreement that's signed by all students where they also must indicate what their measurable objectives are. What is it that you expect to accomplish in this course? Students have a very hard time coming up with measurable obje objectives, so I try to tell them, hint, hint, what course do you want in the grade? I don't care whether you want an A or a B or a C, but I agree on what you want and then work accordingly because you're going to be held accountable for achieving those objectives. Now, once you have that, then we get ready to practice, and again, as I indicated, you can learn how to ride a bicycle by reading about it, but you really need is somebody by your side to hold you when you start to fall, to guide you, and that's what we do in class. We provide coaching and consulting, and I work very closely with 
but we have a, a business communication center where they have, have expertise in helping students to effectively work in teams. And of course, I work on that too. Now, once that is done, the whole process simply is, okay, topic one is learned in a group. You take your individual quiz. Then you go to topic two, learn it as a group. You take your individual quiz. All the time, you're enhancing your leadership abilities and your subject matter knowledge that then goes in my course in having them work together on a semester long project. So that is the process that we have. And again, just to summarize, they basically get upfront review of leadership. Um, we restructure the class in terms of modules. We implement flipped or blended learning in the class. And then we essentially have them go through the concurrent process where they do a module, they work together, and then they take an exam, a subject matter, an individual exam. There's no group <coughs> exam. So once that is done, then, gosh, does it work? Well, we have um, analyzed a lot of data, and basically um, the, this whole process does enhance the leadership qualities of students. It also, um, the coaching and the and consulting that we provide further enhances the leadership potential of students and enhanced leadership uh, qualities enhances overall course performance. Again, those are all quantified results that we have gotten. Uh, we have a paper coming out on October 10th that um, goes over these particular concepts and provides the data for it. Um, not only that, but this whole process recently received the award, the innovative teaching award from the National Meeting of the Institute of Physician Sciences for the most innovative approach teaching. Okay, well, we did that. We were happy. Our students were a lot happier, all documented. Um, but we asked our students to give us their, their psychometric information their personality type and their locus of control type at the beginning of the course so they could form teams. And I said, no, oh, it would be interesting to see what happens at the end. All of the people in the field indicate that, gee, personality is something you're born with. It's really hard to change. It certainly doesn't change in a short period of time, but I was curious. And what we found is um, that um, I had to find a, a personality indicator test the Myers-Briggs, the one that's most often used, but you gotta pay for that. So there's another one that's called 16 Personalities, which is a takeoff, it's free, it gives you, it has you take a test, it puts you into 16 personalities. Those personalities are the, essentially determined by the role that you play and by how you execute that particular role. So this is how the personality test works, it gives you then when you're done, it tells you, okay, you are an INFJ that A, you are essentially an advocate, and these are your characteristics. So it gives you descriptive information of what your personality type, or what your personality type is. Um, and it comes out essentially, again, as a set of um, five numbers. The middle three tell you what the role is. The external two tells you how you fulfill that role, the strategies that you use for that. So, um, locus of control is something I don't know if you're familiar with. I was not, but that's basically a measure that places you between a one and a 10, where a person that scores one is a person that says, I'm the master of my fate, I'm the captain of my ship, and I know that I can achieve the results that I want on my own. The people on the other extreme, at the 10 level, they are the ones that said, gee, it doesn't matter what I do, <coughs> nature is going to do it to me anyway. So I really don't have that much control over what happens because there are too many external factors. I, there's always something that intervenes. So in between that scale, between being totally self-assured and totally feel like the victim of fate, then you get a particular number. So again, these numbers are conventional wisdom is that they don't change, they sort of, sort of born with them. Although 
locus of control, you can form that in particular in young kids because to have a good locus of control, then all you really need to teach your children is that for every action, there is a predictable reaction. In other words, there are consequences to whatever you do, and those consequences are always consistent. So, what did we find? Oh my gosh, um, we took 300 students and monitored them. These students were online, they were face to face, and we saw that they changed their personalities and the locus of control in unimaginable numbers to us. We had almost half of the people in a period of a semester change their personalities and their locus of control. That was an absolute shock. Um, nobody believed us until we showed them the data. And then we decided to look at it a little bit more. Well, how about locus of control? Did that change for people that had an unchanged personality type or did it change for people that had a changed personality type, changed personality type at a different rate? And the answer was no, everybody changes their personality and their locus of control, which to us was, whoa. So, okay, let's take a further look at the analysis. We looked at our locus of control information and we said, well, logically it seems that your ending locus of control is going to be related to your beginning locus of control. That's the hypothesis. So we said, well, let's test that. Let's come up with a simple regression model and say that the end locus of control is a linear function of the beginning locus of control. And let's put that data in and crunch it and see what comes out. Well, what came out is that you had some pretty strong R squares in these. You had strong statistical models and you had essentially the linear equations that came out of it. We looked at these linear equations that came out of that and we were really amazed because what they told us is that these linear equations were such that they told us that the, pre, that the predictions for locus of control were higher for people that started with a low locus of control, and they were lower for people that started with a higher locus of control. In other words, if you started with a low locus of control, the teamwork made your ending locus of control higher, and if you started with a high locus of control, your teamwork made your ending locus of control smaller. In other words, it all came to the middle. And perhaps you can think about that. If you're part of a team, you tend to do what? You, know, you tend to not be too extreme unless you really enjoy that particular role. But you know, that we found that very interesting. And we found the point at which this occurred, and we call that the crossover point. You know, that's the point at which you essentially, your personality, switch from being higher at the end and it's supposed to lower. Okay, well, what does that mean? Um, basically, um, this is what I have just mentioned. And um, when we looked at that and, and, and locus of control, we said, okay, that, that's what we can squeeze out of the locus of control information. What can I squeeze out of the PTI changes? Well, what we found here is that at the beginning of the course, 10% of the people were what they call analysts. At the end of the course, 18% were analysts. So there was a substantial change. At the beginning of the course, 18 were um, diplomats. At the end, 25. So there were shifts between these major personality components. We also found that the same, that when you had a shift of the, of the 10 percent that you had, a significant number of those essentially um, switched to a completely different role model. So those were what we call substantial personality changes as opposed to trivial ones. We did the same thing with strategies. Um, they changed also. So we were really sitting there saying, oh my gosh, what does all of this mean? Students go to an intensive collaborative experience defined by the CLD, the Contextual Leadership Development, and oh my God, you aren't the same person at the end 
that you are at the beginning. You were transformed. And we tried to decide, well, how, how can we get a better handle on this? We like this emotional um, or personality type measure, but the problem with it, it gave you simply classification, the category. It didn't give you a number. So it was very difficult to analyze. So we said, hmm, maybe what we need to do is look at some other um, kind of a personality measure that's more of a quantitative as opposed to a categorical measure. We then went and said, well, are there any other psychology, psychometrics that we have to look at? And somebody in one of these conferences said, well, how about emotional intelligence? And I said, hmm, emotional intelligence? Okay, well, let's take a look at that. And we found some people that had used it. We found an instrument to measure it. And then we asked the question, do these psychometric changes influence team cohesiveness? In other words, since all of these extremes sort of went to the middle, are we coming up with a team that's closer together at the end of this collaboration expense, um, experience than at the beginning? We also um, asked, well, so what? If, if, if they do, in fact, become more co cohesive, do they perform better as a group? And then we said, oh, wait a minute, by the way, as they perform better, does that also change their psychometrics? So these are questions that came up and intrigued us. So we looked at these. We went up to a new personality scale, one that has seven <coughs> domains, if you will. Each measured between one and five. Um, it's in the literature, there it is. Um, we also went to an emotional intelligence, the global emotional intelligence test, and emotional intelligence is defined in terms of how we're of your own psycholo psychological state, somebody else's, how do you manage yourself, your own emotions, how do you help other people manage their emotions. So again, these were things that we thought might come into play in what we're doing. We did a pilot test and we looked at all of these new factors, our new personality, <coughs> our emotional intelligence, and by gosh and by golly, everybody changed. Almost everybody. A large number of people changed. So this corroborated what we found with our other personality test, except this gave us a measure to try to go deeper into it. Well, when we looked at the results, we found very interesting that the beginning personality trait were highly correlated to the ending personality traits. It sort of makes sense when you don't start from ground zero. But here we say we can predict by how much you can change. And that happened to us with the locus of control. So that same thing happened with our emotional intelligence. There is a high correlation between the beginning and your ending values. So having that prompted us to ask the same question as before. Do these guys have crossover points like locus of control? And guess what? Every single trait had a crossover point. At the beginning, if you were scored low on the personality trait, at the end of the intense collaboration experience, you scored higher. If you started high in the score on the personality trait, at the end you scored lower. So you, again, this collaborative experience tended to make people more alike. But again, these were tendencies. And we were very interested in finding out whether if any of these tendencies had any statistical significance. And we found that only three in total between emotional intelligence and between um, um, personality type, only three factors had a statistical significance. Teamwork increased extraversion. Teamwork increased openness to new ideas, to new experiences. And team collaboration decreased altruism. Okay, now what, what did we make of those? Well, we said, first of all, with the crossover points, um, with the, um, um, that, that we have, gosh, you know, again, working together makes you more alike. That's what we thought. 
Um, and basically, what you are in a team, you try to find the happy medium between making you point and making people unhappy with your insistence about your point. So that's that's a learning experience. Um, the significant changes in personality traits we found interesting. The increase in extraversion we felt was due to the fact that students now were forced to work with each other. They could not hide in their own, could not hide in their own shell. So they were more extroverted. They had to work more, go more outside their shell to get other ideas. Um, openness to experience, gosh, if you interact more with people, then you hear more ideas. And if you don't have any better ideas, you start to realize that you don't have to know it all. You can rely on somebody in your team to perhaps know, know it also. So you have that. And altruism, this we attribute to the fact that an altruism means getting things away from nothing. Okay? You know, we basically said, hey, you know, people that work hard in teams, by the end of the semester, are, are not very happy giving their stuff away if somebody doesn't collaborate. So those are the kinds of deductions that we made from the numerical results that we have. And our conclusions were that basically um, this contextual leadership development, this intensive collaborative effort, um, increased team cohesiveness, where cohesiveness basically is defined very loosely as the shared bond that drives team members um, to stay and work together. Um, we also found that um, teams may offer benefits, but in large part these benefits will only be realized in teams that work together, that, that have cohesion. If you have people that don't, are not cohesive, that go in their own direction, you're not going to get good results. Um, cohesion is essential for teams, and cohesion is key to organizational and team performance. So these were the things that we got out of the literature. And the cohesiveness factors are basically dependent on how you all buy into what you are supposed to accomplish by how related you feel to the status of your other members, how you like your other members, how proud you are to serve in that team, and the morale of the team. These are the five factors that define this thing that we refer to as cohesiveness. Well, you know, how do you measure those? We don't quite know, except by qualitative means. I have several hundred um, what I call reflection paper from students about the course and what they think worked and what didn't work. And many, many of them came back and uh, mentioned that co collaboration was one of the key things that they learned how to do in the course. And that's basically this, well, what this person says. The thing saying is that after the first exam, they realized that the collaboration possibilities really increased their eyes, opened their eyes. Well, if we went then further, one further, after the next exam, they said, oh, wow, I really believe that now that we have worked together, I really believe we have been transformed. And by golly, they were transformed. Their personalities were different. That's what those personality measures gave us. So that's then the um, examples from the students, we have a whole bunch of more, several hundred of these. Um, so these comments, which um, were shared by most members in the classes, uh, strength, um, reflected that they did strengthen the shared bonds that drive team members to stay together and want to work together. In other words, their cohesiveness increased. So the question then is, does cohesiveness really tie to performance? Does our data show that kind of information? And we said, OK, um, the literature basically says this. And the answer is yes. Cohesiveness increases performance. We looked at our data. And um, you know, there's always a problem when you ask students in the class to essentially fill out questionnaires about how they did in the class. So what we did is we got somebody in a class that was taken after the one that I teach. And that could be several semesters later, because these, many of these are distant learning students. And I said, OK, let's take the data from all the data that we have, 909, 
90 some MBA students over the past X number of years. And let me divide it up into students that took um, this course with me, this course with a faculty member, not by me, not with this faculty member that taught at this time, by me teaching CLD and me after CLD, we basically took the data and sliced and diced it every which way that we could. And then we threw it into a multiple regression and by golly, what came out of that, the only variable that was very strongly significant was students that had taken or experienced the CLD approach. Those students did better in the subsequent class than students that did not take the CLD. So that to us that says, okay, there's a long lasting effect on the personality effect last and the performance effect last, not just in this course, but to a future course and hopefully throughout their life. So this and basically has been our journey. Uh, we are now concluding that the intense collaboration experiences change team members' personality to achieve a more cohesive team that will deliver increased performance. That's basically the bottom line that we see to all of this kind of stuff. And that's the story. Thank you.